Hello and welcome to another conversation with myself, Mark Vernon and Rupert Sheldrake. Hi there, Rupert. Hi, Mark. Today, you suggested that we talk about energy. We talked about gravity last time we met, in fact, but today to turn to another sort of fundamental physical notion, that of energy, with the sense that whilst this is used widely in science, of course, and even more generally, asking just what energy actually is might be quite interesting in brackets, because maybe people aren't really that clear about what energy is, even though it's measured and worked into equations and, and so on. So do you, do you want to kick us off on this subject? I mean, you know, what, what does a scientist mean by energy? Well, the central unifying principle really of 19th century physics was energy it's the principle of conservation of energy which is the first law of thermodynamics um, energy is neither created nor destroyed it can be transformed but it's neither created nor destroyed and in a closed system uh, then uh, it, you can measure how it's transformed and so on um, in the whole universe which is a uh, an entire system in itself, it's supposed not to be created or destroyed. Well, we'll come back to that because actually modern physics says it is created. But nevertheless, classical energy theory says that there's a fundamental principle of movement, actuality or change in nature, um, which can take many forms. And we're familiar to, with this from, say, electric energy in a plug socket. The electric energy is promiscuous. The, the energy in that plug socket can do all sorts of things. It can power an electric toaster, a hairdryer, a computer, a mobile telephone, uh, a fan. Uh, the same energy can do lots of different things. And the same is true of the sun's energy. As the sun beams down on the earth, you know, it can uh, create electricity in a photovoltaic cell, or it can power a cabbage plant growing in a, an allotment, or it can power a beech tree growing in a wood. Um, it can do all these different things and be transformed into cabbages and beaches and uh, and so on and, and electricity. Um, and and then it can be burned a beach through the wood from the beech tree can be burned and give off heat and light, which is also uh, of the forms of energy. And there's chemical energy, uh, which is released in burning uh, uh, and in oil and coal and, and, and so on and chemical energy can be released electrically as in batteries so all of these and it can be turned into mechanical energy as in steam engines i mean thermodynamics was primarily about heat and and mechanical work as in steam engines so this unifying principle shows us that energy permeates the entire universe it's in all the stars all the galaxies all the light all the chemicals uh, all atomic nuclei uh, can be converted into radiation um, as in uh, E equals mc squared energy equals the mass destroyed times the square of the velocity of light as in atom bombs. Uh, so it's this huge unifying principle of all nature um, and that is one of the tremendous insights of modern science and um, it's can, because it can take so many forms uh, it's you know utterly fundamental to everything. Now the origins of this idea, I think, are one thing we should look into. And in science in the 17th century, there was already a kind of precursor of this, because uh, the mechanistic vision of the universe in 17th century science said the universe was a machine. Uh, being, uh, the laws of nature were mathematical ideas in the mind of God. And God had started off the machine um, by giving it a certain amount of motion. And because the motion imparted to the universe like the revolving of planets on their in their orbits and so on because all this motion was imparted by god and was god given uh, it was therefore uh, it couldn't be destroyed and so it was a kind of god given principle of conservation of energy and then in the 19th century it turned into the much more general principle which underlies all science as we know it that's very interesting the origins there because of course the word itself is much older i think Philosophers have argued that Aristotle, so this is in the fifth, fourth century BC, um, coins the word energy. And it does have 
the notion of work um, that you mentioned there, you know, energy is that which does the work. Um, but with Aristotle, though, there's, as with all the ancients and indeed the medieval figures before the 16th century, as you mentioned there, there's a much more powerful sense of a, a living quality to this. You know, energy is is activity, it's action, it's operation, not in the sense of a machine, which of course didn't really exist in the sense we mean that back then, um, but in the sense of, of a kind of presence of, of actuality. Aristotle contrasts energy with potentiality. Um, so the potential is that which uh, could be born, and then energy is that which is born. And and you 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 get this older sense still in Orthodox theology, in fact, where God's energeia is God's living vitality, presence in the world. And so we participate in divine life because everything that we feel as energetic is actually part of the divine energeia. And so that sort of sense of existence itself in all its fullness Um it's very interesting when you make that reference to how in the 17th century there's this notion that God sort of imparts a quantity of motion into the cosmos that then, through this law of conservation, subsequently is preserved. But of course, what's lost there is that the divine reference is cut off. It's seen now as a self-contained system rather than as a manifestation of the divine energeia. Yes, in the 17th century, they called it vis viva, the moving force, the, the, the living force, vis viva, vis is force, viva is life. And um, so there was this sense of it being, in a sense, connected to life or movement, change, and the energy within all things. Um, yes, I think that the the way it's been mechanized is, it, you know, because as soon as it's turned into equations and then the law of conservation of energy means energy can be tre treated like something on a balance sheet, like accounting so much before and so much after a process of physical change. Um, it then becomes a much more mechanical. You lose this sense of the life uh, and the flow of the energy. Mm. I think another... But, sorry, did you want to say more? There's another sort of telling point. Yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. No, quite another telling point in that, which I've got from... A person I often refer to, Owen Barfield, who was very interested in the roots of words and how concepts change, even though the word is the same, but when it's used in very different contexts, it can actually be conveying a very different sense of the word. And and he notes actually that apparently quite a seminal mo mo moment came when Huxley, T.H. Huxley, wrote a book called Capital and Labour and talks there about the way that biology works, particularly looking at bodies as machines. But it's very interesting that he's written it in a book about capital and labour, um, which immediately gives it a certain kind of economic inflection, which, you know, I was reminded of when you mentioned accounting there, but also how he uses engineering metaphors in order to describe the body. Um, and, you know, he wasn't an engineer, of course, but, and he didn't have I suppose you'd say, I mean, as far as I know, anyway, he doesn't build this in um, a sort of a felt love of materials. You know, the artist will know a lot about materials, but it'd be very different from the sense in which a scientist knows about materials, because the artist will have that living relationship with the paint or the wood or the metal um, and then how they can work those things. And um, whereas with Huxley, this more engineering approach dominates um, and. So energy then, which was a metaphor transported into the engineering context, loses the memory of how it was a metaphor. And so becomes a sort of dead metaphor, seems like something factual. And Boff was very interested in how in the 19th century machines in general, which, you know, machine originally had referred to manual labor. Um, so again, it was a sort of living human quality, and now it becomes completely uncoupled from the human. Um, you know, one of the things which we would say about a machine is it's not human, strangely. And another word that does a very fascinating about turn is related. It's the word automaton. Mm. Plato, even, let alone Aristotle, had talked about that which is automatic. But for him, it meant that which is self-organizing, self-moving, 
And that was because it contained its own soul, its own purpose and capacity to move. Whereas that which wasn't automata was that which needed to be pushed or pulled or programmed or shoved or whatever. And now, you know, that that's almost completely inverted. The automata is that which is moving blindly. Um, and to call a human being an automata now would be rather offensive. Um, and so a lot shifts. And, and it also really quite recently, just the 19th century, a lot of this imaginative change really comes about. Um, so we feel the conceit, perhaps, Barfield called it chronological snobbery, that um, we're living in the world that understands these things correctly, whereas actually things are borrowed and they're borrowed for good reason, as you're saying. You know, these models can be built and they can be made to work and practical, have great benefit. Um, but what gets lost, what gets kind of just sort of cut off? Um, and so imaginatively, we lose contact culturally with that wider picture. Well, it's interesting, isn't it, that you say that as it was mechanized in machinery, uh, but and it was before more about life and actual manual work. But it's interesting, we still use the word horsepower when describing a car and the capacity of a car, you know, and, and the power of its motion. So horsepower is, is still in use. And, and, and in relation to horsepower, then you've got the power, a horse pulling a cart or a horse pulling a plow. Um, you've got a living source of energy there, which then can be replaced by a machine. And a machine can have 12 horsepower or 20 horsepower and stuff. And so we actually still in our modern language have a residue of this living energy. Yeah, that's wonderful. It's, it's worth noting those and asking, you know, where did that come from? Yes. Um, that's, that's really good, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but the other thing, when you were talking about the capitalism and T.H. Huxley um, and his book on capital and labor, there's another way in which we borrow in our economic system from this energy language. Because the two main forms of energy uh, that we have since the 19th century are kinetic energy, the energy of movement, and potential energy, uh, the energy of a wound up watch spring, or if you lift a weight, uh, you know, an old fashioned clock. And uh, my son Merlin used to wind the clock at a local church, Christ Church. And once a week he had to go and wind this uh, handle where, where this big weight. And then as it gradually dropped, it powered the clock, which just uh, worked and chimed for a whole week on the basis of a lot of effort winding <laughs> up this weight. And that was giving the weight potential energy in the gravitational field. So potential energy uh, could turn into kinetic energy as it moved and make the cogs and the, the springs and things go around in, in the clock. But then when we translate those concepts into the monetary world, we have capital and currency. And so capital is like potential energy. You know, if you've got a million pounds in the bank, you've got the potential to do all sorts of things. By itself, it's static in the bank, like a, you know, a weight that's lifted to a height and just stays there, but it has the capacity to uh, generate kinetic energy as it falls. And the capital, um, if invested, has the capacity to make things happen and cause kinetic energy, people building things, machines, laborers, concrete mixers, and all that kind of thing, or factories or, or whatever, or buying a car that then moves and stuff. Um, and the, the, what keeps the whole economy going is what we call currency. And the, and we talk about the flow of currency. Um, you know, and, and we have booms and slumps in currency, um, which are, are like the flow of current in a river. And the current, the flow of current in a river, which used to power water mills, uh, which were the first step in the industrial revolution, flow, powered by the flow of water, and then later by the flow of steam, because it was still a flow that powered steam engines and still does. Um, uh, again, then it's a flow principle, which is again, energy is basically about flow and currency uh, is about flow. Um, so uh, it's interesting that our, so much of our thinking is permeated by these metaphors. Yeah, and, and I guess it's always worth asking how well the metaphor works. Um, say when it comes to the economy, 
it's quite routine now to read articles saying that everything that economists predicted or the antidotes to problems that the economists suggested may or may not work. It seems, you know, rather random whether they do or not, whether the predictions turn out or whether turning on the capital flow or whatever it might be yes. does, that well, does the well, trick. And well, I guess that's because people forget we're working for metaphors and models here and what's actually going on may be or may not be that connected. Yes, or liquid assets or liquidity uh, is permeated by these. And actually, when, when I was at Cambridge uh, as a, uh, an undergrad, as a research student, um, I, I came to know the professor of econometrics, Richard Stone, and I was discussing models with him. And he told me about something I'd never heard of before, which is that um, until I think in the 1940s and 50s, uh, certainly in his lifetime, the main model that the Treasury had used of the British economy was a hydrodynamical model where you had reservoirs of fluid which represented currency. And, and then you had tubes with currency flows and taps and valves. And you could change the interest rate by changing taps. And then it had sort of re reservoirs in it which would fill up. And if it filled too full, then there was a siphon and you get booms and slumps. You know, like the flushing systems in gentlemen's urinals where it, it fills up and then when it reaches a certain level, the whole thing flushes. Um, and um, they, the, 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 before, before computer models came in, these were actually commercially manufactured. The government of New Zealand had one. and There's one in the Science Museum at Cambridge still. Um, that the models of the economy were actually based on hydrodynamical flows. Quite literally, that is amazing. Yes. I wonder whether another way, though, in which um, the machine mentality has an impact is in relation to energy meant in a more psychological or spiritual sense. You know, energy is a word that is used there. And in the original context of Aristotle and so on, that was completely natural. Um, energy was seen to be the movement of soul or Edegaea was the vital presence of God. But I think what can happen now is that in some spiritual practices or psychological techniques, the machine deployment of the word energy rather, I think, detracts or weakens from the potential benefit of the practice. Um, you know, take something like tapping, um, you know, which I, I do use. Um, and <laughs> Even though it's taught in a rather mechanical way that if you you know do this particular kind of tapping, say this kind of phrase, then it automatically releases energy in the body. And I think what can get lost there is actually you've got to have a felt connection with the tapping, with the words being used, and to feel the soulfulness of the phrase that you decide to deploy and and to feel into the effects of tapping on the body. Um, and and that, that so that makes it much more personal. And, and I think even the the quality of the person teaching the tapping um, matters too, because a sort of felt resonance is connected. Then um, the energy of one um, titrates almost into another. Although I've used the hydraulic metaphor there, um, maybe maybe it's more like a shared kind of energy, a, a shared life, a shared vitality. Um, and I think this matters in psychology because um when a technique looks like it can be manualized or automatized all you have to do is do this that and the other and a certain kind of psychological effect comes about this then gets moved um into um into the computer so you have you know counseling or advice um through an ai through a machine and i you know i i wouldn't be surprised if this brings some benefit because there is a certain amount of just learning what to do. Um, but the benefit in terms of actual change in the person themselves starts to fall away um, because the, the mechanization of these energy techniques has lost touch with the, the real efficacy there, which is the movement of energia, it's the movement of soul. Um, you know, William Blake writing in the 17th and 18th century um, 18th and 19th century rather so he talked about energy a lot you know energy is eternal delight he said energy is the only life um, and that I like it when he puts it poetically because it helps remind me that we're talking about something that can't be pushed and pulled around 
you know, like um, the, 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 the contraptions you were talking about there, but must be sort of felt and engaged with, related to, you might say, um, energy in that sense. This brings in uh, the, the bigger question of other forms of energy, like in uh, the Indian system, prana, or in the Chinese system, qi, which are forms of energy that flow through the body and flow from person to person. And a lot of their medical systems are based on the flow of these energies, or what are sometimes called subtle energies, um, um, which would relate to tapping, because that's the tapping is related to these, it's called energy medicine. I mean, that's the general term under which some of these therapies are, 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 are classified. Um, and we have no idea in scientific terms what these other forms of energy are. They seem to be forms of energy. They've been described for centuries or millennia in the Indian and the Chinese systems as, as kinds of energy. Um, and yet they don't map on to the standard kinds in Western science. And there are plenty of mysteries about the energy within life. I mean, one of the ones I'm intrigued by is the, you know, the assumption that our bodies or any animal body is a thermodynamic machine was a 19th century assumption. And Helmholtz, who started this, uh, at first tried to prove it scientifically and he failed. So he then just said, well, don't bother with any proof or evidence. It's by definition bodies and animal and human bodies and machines, so therefore they must obey the same laws of energy as steam engines. Um, and around 1900, there was a famous study by two Americans called Atwater and Benedict, who set out to demonstrate, they said, we're not setting out to investigate, we're setting out to demonstrate that living organisms and the human body in particular follows the law of conservation of energy. Um, and they made it clear from the outset, they had no doubt this was the answer that they'd find. And they measured people in calorimeters, the food taken in, the liquids that came out, the heat and, and the energy work done, etc., by pedaling cycle pedals and things. Uh, they measured all this and they came out with exactly the answer they expected. But when this was investigated uh, decades later by someone called Webb, an American uh, nutritionist, uh, he found there were huge discrepancies. He was getting massive errors. Some people who were thin and, and uh, were, seemed to be giving out too much energy, and some people who were fat weren't giving out enough, and there were huge errors. Um, and it wasn't, you know, he took into account the converted into fat cells and weight, weight gain and all that kind of thing. And he then looked back at Atwater and Benedict's results and found they too had had huge discrepancies in the individual measurements, but they just put in enough people who were above the average and enough below the average, so it averaged out at the answer that they knew they'd get in the first place. And then there are all these cases of so-called inedia, where in Indian tradition, Chinese, European tradition, there are people who allegedly live for weeks, months, or even years without eating, seeming to defy every known principle of the conservation of energy. And of course, the usual assumption of Western scientists, oh, of course, they're eating secretly, and they're sneaking out and eating biscuits or something when no one's looking. Um, but there have been actual scientific studies of Indian sages who seem to live without food. And even of um, saints, so Teresa Boyman was a 20th century example in Germany. Um, uh, quite a number of saintly figures have done this, and Christian saints. There have also been documented cases of people who are not saints, but who just, for some reason, seem to live without food. Now, obviously, it doesn't happen to everyone, because otherwise people on hunger strikes uh, who wouldn't ever fast to death. They just live forever as an embarrassment to governments and, <laughs> uh, and support of their cause. Um, but there are, these are huge unanswered questions, and it's not the kind of thing anyone within the scientific world would investigate. And um, in India, they might, or they could. And there's more people who do this in India. There are plenty of living examples, I'm sure. Um, so it's not as if we've figured out everything to do with energy, at least in relation to living organisms. And there are these other concepts, the idea that they, the Indians who live without food say they get the energy, the prana from the sunlight or from the air, or breatharians, 
who are Westerners who claim to live without food, uh, say they're getting it from the prana, the energy in the air. Uh, no, What's I, next going on? We just don't know. I mean, I partly wonder about that as well, just in terms of working as a psychotherapist and the notion of you know, having more energy or I didn't have any energy. These phrases are used all the time in terms of people's psychological mood. And they clearly have often substantial effect on people's quality of life. Someone who says they don't have energy and really means it, you know, will hardly be able to get anything done in the day. It's very dramatic. And I guess that there are physiological attempts to explain that. Um, and maybe or maybe not, they go some of the way. Um, but it does seem to be a very powerful notion that the energy which we have, or the very least our capacity to use energy, is not just related to the amount of food stuff that we're taking in. Um, and but but I guess that the, the skeptic would get very nervous of what you're saying, and they would start waggling their finger perhaps and talking about vitalism or searching for some kind of mysterious stuff that makes for life we're into that kind of terrain i suppose i mean what 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 what's your response to to that accusation well i would simply say well you know what are the empirical facts you know it's an assumption that all living organisms just follow mechanistic principles and Vitalism, um, there are various forms of vitalism, but some forms of vitalism said that, yes, there are forms of energy in living organisms which are not the same as just regular physical energy. Uh, I would just say it's an open question and, and that one good way of investigating it is to study people with inedia. Um, another way would be to re-examine um, the um, study organisms, dogs, cats, mice, rats, whatever you like, in calorimeters, these classic studies, and see whether under different conditions of living, what the energy balance is. No one does those experiments anymore because it's just assumed um, that that you know the answer in advance, like Atwater and Benedict assumed in the in 1900. Uh, so it's not on the research agenda. Um, so I think I'd ask the the sneering skeptic, you know, where's your evidence? And they'd probably point to Atwater and Benedict. And then you'd say, well, what about web studies? And then they'd have to say, oh, well, they're unreliable or they've been discredited or they won't have heard of them, of course, or have read them. But then it becomes clear this is a doctrinal assertion, not an empirical scientific one. Maybe, maybe this question will press a bit harder again because this is slightly going off at a tangent, but this the new move towards systems biology and the recognition that biological organisms work at multiple levels with various exchanges and even with the the wider environment as well i was just reading the new book by philip ball the science writer on this and actually i noticed very early in the book he sort of clears his throat and says this is not an appeal to some kind of vitalism but it's interesting that he had to sort of signal that so who knows maybe this will yes. return out of necessity uh, let alone just curiosity well he... one last thing rupert unless you got anything else but you do us at do. the beginning about energy being created in fact rather than the 19th century assumption about the conservation of energy what what did you have in mind there well, i've got two further points actually oh, okay okay before we end one is about the creation of energy you see because the I, the current scientific theory is that energy and matter can't be created or destroyed or it's the principle of conservation of matter and energy because they are interconvertible so the current theory is that all the matter and energy in the universe suddenly appeared from nowhere at the moment of the Big Bang. Um, it's the one free miracle principle that Terence McKenna used to refer to. Modern science is based on the principle of one free miracle. The appearance of all the matter and energy in the universe and all the laws that govern it from nothing in a single instant. So there's one unbelievably massive violation of the principle of conservation of matter and energy, but just one in the standard view. However, um, by, by the year 2000, um, at that time, people thought that the universe would stop expanding and it would gradually uh, there, it slow down, stop expanding and then begin to contract under all the gravity from matter and dark matter within the universe, ending in the reverse of the Big Bang called the Big Crunch. But then it was discovered uh, around 2000 that actually the most distant galaxies have enormous redshifts and they seem to be moving 
away faster and faster, that the universe is not slowing down. In fact, the rate of expansion is speeding up. Now, he didn't expect that. So how do you explain it? Well, then they say it must be speeding up because they're being pushed apart by dark energy, inventing a new form of energy to um, explain what's observed. And then when you say, well, what, en what is dark energy? They don't know. But the main equations of dark energy, which come from the cosmological constant, which is the energy of space, um, say that there is a fixed amount of energy per unit volume. Well, since the universe is expanding, the volume of the universe is increasing, and therefore the amount of energy is increasing. Um, so therefore, the universe has become a perpetual motion machine, uh, according to modern cosmology. Um, they don't like talking about this, but um, th this violates all the fundamental principles, uh, and yet um, they've got no explanation other than invoking all this dark energy. Um, so that's another unexplained aspect of this. But the final point I wanted to make really was that um, if we look at the most fundamental models of reality which we find in theology, then in Trinitarian models, like the Christian model of the Holy Trinity, what we find is a model that has a ground of being, which is the, the God the Father, or in the Hindu model of the Trinity, it's Sat, as in Sat, Chit, Ananda. Um, or in the Hindu Trinity of Gods, it's Brahma, which is the God, the creation, ultimate source of all things. Then we have a principle of energy or flow, which is spirit. Um, or breath or wind, the same word ruach or pneuma in Greek, ruach in Hebrew, uh, means breath, flow. Uh, and this is one of your, uh, you know, Owen Barfield's big points that the, you, these words weren't distinguished. The energy, flow, breath, all these things were the same word. It's the same. So the Holy Spirit is a principle of flow, movement, change. It's always represented by the wind, the breath, by the fire, flames of fire by flying birds. It's about movement change. And the other principle is the logos, the word, which is the principle of form or structure or order. And so spoken language um, is the principal metaphor. Like when I'm speaking now, there's the flow of breath as I breathe out. Without that, there'd be no spoken words. There's the form and structure of the words that come from the forms and structures in my mind and are articulated through the larynx and the speech apparatus as the air flows over them. Uh, but the, the f spoken word is a combination of the principles for form and energy. And that is exactly the model that science gives us of everything in the universe. Everything has energy to have actuality or reality or activity. And yet the energy has to have form. The energy has no form in and of itself. So the energy of an electron is given form by the electron field. An electron is a vibratory pattern in an electron field, a proton in a proton field. An atom uh, is a vibratory structure of activity within the quantum fields of the atom. Uh, so everything in nature has energy and form. And um, the, the fundamental source of those uh, in this theological model is the Holy Trinity. In one of the Hindu models, the Brahma one, the three uh, the trinity of principal gods there, Brahma, the source, um, Vishnu, the preserver, uh, the maintainer and preserver of order, who's the principle of former uh, order, and Shiva, the creator and destroyer, who's the principle of change, and who's represented by flames, by the dance, as in Nataraja, the dancing Shiva. So we have these fundamental archetypal patterns in, in theologies and in the most fundamental philosophy. Um, where there's a source of both, but then within nature, there's the principle of movement, change or flow, spirit, or in its secularized scientific form, energy, and the principle of form, which mainly comes from fields uh, in, in the physical view of nature, uh, the principle of order. So we can see, I think, that the whole of the energy in nature, including regular energy in electric wires and in boulders rolling down hills and in, um, in, in the movements of the planets and the kinetic energy of billiard balls and so on. All these forms of energy are transforms of this ultimate energetic principle, uh, which is fundamental to all creation, is ultimately part of the divine ground of being. And that's a, such a wonderful vision and 
it connects back to this orthodox notion of Enegea because Enegea is the presence of God in this threefold form, as you're saying. It's not like a fourth element, um, but, but the Enegea is known in the ground, in the logos, in the forming principle, and then also in the flow, the spirit of change mm. as well. Yeah. Um, and you, I mean, it's, it's, I love it when you, you make these moves. Um feels like we've been in the world of science, but actually when you just look that extra bit further, the theology starts to show up again. And then you realize you can hear the science as describing being in the divine body um, of the created world. Um, so kind of completing the loop back to something which I think would have made sense to Aristotle. I really do experience it that way. You know, I think when we think of energy, if we think of it just through pages of textbooks and equations, we get this narrow cramped view. But when you look at it in reality, like the clouds blowing past in the wind um, and the way it's expressed in the natural world and in lightning strikes in our own breathing and in the energy of movement and the energy of human made machines as well. I mean, all of these and that energy in our machines like jet planes is fossil fuel energy and that ultimately derives from the sun. Um, um, so uh, we have all, you know, they, all of these forms of energy, uh, they're not artificial. They're all part of the flow that's part of the whole cosmos. Look, on that note, on that experience of what we've been talking about, we should draw to a close. But thank you so much. Well, thank you, Mark. <laughs>